Hey, what's up, Ron here. In today's video, you'll learn how to convey a beautiful sense of light and shadow using contrast. Now, you wanna make sure to stay tuned till the end of this video, because around the end, I'll share with you one bonus tip for getting out of tough spots in watercolor. So if you're too lost in the details, you're not sure what you're doing, I'm gonna share a trick with you that will help you regain control over what's going on on paper. So with that, let's get into the process. Now, I almost completely skipped the drawing stage here. I will include a photo of the drawing stage. If you want to pause the video, just trace it paint, uh, so that you can paint along with me. But in any case, in this lesson, we'll look at all kinds of contrast because I mentioned conveying a beautiful sense of light and shadow using contrasts. We will explore all kinds of contrasts in this one, uh, such as the shapes. So a contrast in the types of shapes you see, the contrast in values and contrast in colors and also in edges, which is something not enough people talk about. So my quick definition for or contrast. It is a difference. It is a change. Okay, so the contrast can be strong and it can be weak. You could have a strong change and a weak change or, you know, something that is a little more nuanced of a change. Now, contrast is responsible for quite a lot of the beauty you see in a painting. Uh, something about a change and difference and this freshness that stimulates the mind of the viewer and basically provides an experience for them as opposed to just looking at a picture, which is a lot more boring than feeling something, having an experience as they look at your paintings. Uh, so first off, we're gonna tackle the first wash. And already here, you can feel the contrast in colors. Uh, we are using mainly oranges, greens, and violets. Now you'll notice something. These are all secondary colors, which is the result of mixing two primary colors together. So blue and red will give you a violet, yellow and red will give you an orange, and lastly, blue and yellow will create a green. Now, my primary colors here, if if you do want to follow what I'm doing, it's French Ultramarine, Quinacridone Rose, and Lemon Yellow. These are all Daniel Smith. And you could also switch that completely and use the Daniel Smith secondary palette. Um, I'm actually using a bit of pre-mixed sap green for many of my greens in this video. It works well with the palette I mentioned here. It looks completely natural, so you can just swap out um, the greens and actually use a premix for those. Now, as for the brush, um, I am using just one for the entire painting. One is enough. It's the Escoda Barocco round, okay? It's size 16. It can easily carry on an entire painting like this one in this particular size, which is seven by 11 inches, okay? Now, the paper I'm using is Saunders Waterford. It is cold press 300 GSM. Now, I'm working my way around the outline of the pumpkins, right? Being a little careful and painting the entire background is one big shape. This is one of the most important concepts I can teach you when it comes to simplifying and enhancing the impression. So in simpler terms, keeping some areas fully merged and flowing together will actually provide a viewer with a more satisfying and stimulating experience when looking at your painting. This is a little like crafting a good story. Some distinction and details are important for the plot and for the world building and for the characters, but some information, and you could argue most of the information, is redundant. And by removing the redundant, we provide a reader with an experience. Again, that's what I aim for with my paintings. Now, you see me filling in those areas areas and, and I'm doing it very effectively and you may feel a little less confident about your brush marks and how smooth your wash is. So here are some quick tips to help you handle that, okay? First, use a big brush and paint small for starters. Next up, I want you to mix a large amount so you uh, don't have to pause in the middle of the wash and mix again and it starts to dry on you and it's a big mess, right? Next, I want you to use more water generally. And lastly, for brush marks, Technique. Now, we do have several videos on handling technique and being a little more efficient and effective with your brush marks. I will put a link somewhere, probably top right corner. If that's something you struggle with, you definitely want to check that out because it will really help. Now, because we used plenty of water and worked effectively, we actually get some time to use wet and wet. And this is a great opportunity to darken some areas, right? This creates a nice frame for the painting, putting the pumpkins in the center of attention. Very often you'll find, especially um, in more zoomed in types of scenes like this one, uh, like, like a still lives, right? Uh, that the frame of the painting tends to get the darker treatment. And this is very different from a larger scale scene, um, like a landscape, cityscape, seascape, all of those, 
where the peripherals of the painting, especially the top part, tends to move away from us and make it getting a little lighter, right? This is very different than still life scenes. Now, look at how cool this is. Instead of letting the background dry, I immediately go in with the orange for the pumpkin. This is the same as before, right? Keep some shapes merged together and others separate to enhance the viewer's experience. Um, and there's another element that goes into that, and that is the contrast, as we said, conveying the light and shadow using contrast. So the contrast of edges. By painting this right side of the pumpkin, uh, while the background is still wet, you form a soft edge there. And the other side of the pumpkin, as well as other parts of the scene, will have an, a hard edge, which creates just a beautiful, fun impression for the viewer and, once again, an experience, right? So contrast, once again, leads to a beautiful and fun experience for the viewer. Now, there's one more contrast to think about here, and that is colors. So the pumpkin is orange, which has a certain feel of warmth to it, whereas violets and greens are mostly, um, can be a little more ambiguous when it comes to temperature, right? Um, because a green is made of blue and yellow, and violet is uh, red and, and blue. So there is a bit more of ambiguity. So the, now do you see how all of these elements work together? The background is a little more ambiguous and you could even argue a little more gray while the focal point is more light. It has the warmer color. Generally speaking, there are some nuances within that orange, of course, but generally speaking, it is um, warmer. Right, um, And also look at what I'm doing here. I'm immediately switching gears into a significantly darker value for the bottom part that is in the shadow. This yet again adds another layer of contrast to, to the pumpkin itself, right? Uh, so inside that one wash that is very unified, you get a very light and kind of orangey part and then a very dark and strong part. Now, determining the values isn't that challenging, to be honest with you. Uh, I always like to have both a colorful and a black and white version of the reference photo in front of me, and this keeps me in check. And it keeps reminding me, pay attention to the values, right? Now, if you have a hard time with that, what I would do is practice some monochromatic work first. Paint this fully in black and white, see what you get. Um, I would argue you'll get something very interesting and beautiful, especially with a scene like this. It already has in the reference photo a lot of interesting contrasts and interesting sharp edges. Now, from the main pumpkin and the shadow, I'm moving into the smaller pumpkin that's right under it, uh, which is one of my favorite parts of this scene. And here you can really see the nuances of violet. It can run a nice gamut from cooler, which is a bit more blue to it, and all the way to the warmer, which has a little more red to it, as we mentioned. Uh, and not to mention here, in particular, I'm actually mixing it with my oranges, right? So it gives it even more warmth. Now, can you tell how I'm barely using any pure colors here throughout the entire painting, right? Everything is more of a nuanced mix, yet the colors feel quite vibrant. And this is one of watercolor's biggest misconceptions. I have to use pure paint straight out of the tube to achieve vibrancy and saturation. Not really vibrancy, saturation. These are all relative. If you paint some parts more muted, more nuanced, and more gray, um, the slightly cleaner paint, even though it's still quite muted, even if it's not 100% clean, like some people believe it has to be, will still, still be perceived as um, pure and vibrant. It's an illusion that your human eye simply cannot ignore. So if you follow that principle of everything is a nuance, but some are just cleaner and others are more neutral, it will still come through. It's just a question of ratios. And once again, I'm using every chance I get to do some wet and wet in order to darken the darker spots within the curves of the small pumpkin, right? Getting these now will create a smoother transition as opposed to waiting for this base wash to dry and then having to, to kind of fight and add a lot of smooth edges yourself manually instead of letting the paint and the wet and wet do the job, which is something I always try to do. Now let's address that small white pumpkin, right? White color when put into shadow can appear a little blue. However, we need to pay attention to the nuances here. This isn't a fully white color, it's actually a warmer cream. And if you look at the right side of the pumpkin, you can see the orange from the pumpkin next to that. 
actually reflecting on it, right? And this is a great thing to be aware of. There's such thing called reflected light. And every color in the scene is influenced by other colors in the scene. And especially white colors or colors that are close to white will be greatly affected by other colors around them. And especially if those colors are hit by light and then the light reflects back onto the white surface. So what this leads to is a relatively warm gray with emphasis on the gray part, right? Uh, I hinted a blue but never quite get there. It's mostly this cream, maybe even a bit orangey and where the light is reflected by the other pumpkin. So I'm taking care of the edges, I'm blending where I see a smooth transition, which is for the majority of this pumpkin, and then I continue the wash using the darker similar mix and moving to the right. Okay. Uh, now while the paint is still wet, you can take your time and really observe. Look at what's going on on paper. So many of my students getting are getting so caught up in the technique, they forget to simply look at what's going on on paper and dance with the paint, right? One thing you have to be able to do is react to what's going on on paper. It's very hard to just direct watercolor to do what you want. You do something, you react to what it does, and that way you dance with the paint and create a beautiful result, right? Is there an area that's worth extending using more paint and preserving a softer edge for a longer space? Is there a spot that needs darkening or even lifting, right? All of these things make a big, big difference in the end result and how good it looks. Um, and talking about, um, you know, context and how all these things work together. Look at how having this orange pumpkin right next to the cream one really brings out the whiteness in the cream one. Again, it's all relative. So even though um, it's it's a warm color, if you just look at that small pumpkin, because of having something so warm next to it actually makes it look a little cooler. Okay, now it's time to start working on the stem for that big pumpkin. And this is one of the coolest points of a value contrast, right? We have a very dark next to a very light. And if you've been paying attention, there's another contrast here. What is it? I'm going to give you a second to think about it. That is correct. It's a contrast of edges. Right next to the harsh stem, there is a soft transition caused by the rounded shape of the pumpkin. You can really see this. So I'm darkening until I feel it's the right contrast. Uh, and then I move on to the left side of the pumpkin. So here we get a fascinating uh, variety of oranges and greens, right? There's a lot of nuances there where the pumpkin kind of meets the light and you see a lot of that light green and orange. It's one of the things that really actually caught my eye the first time I was looking at this photo. Um, so that's a very beautiful thing to even exaggerate, perhaps, maybe you want to push the green to be a little stronger. So you keep putting uh, colors into this pre wet area, right, we pre wet this entire area, and we keep injecting or charging color into it until it looks right. And this is a bit of a challenging technique, something to work on. Now, this entire area is responsible once again, for one of the strongest contrasts in value, just like we've seen with the stem, it's the meeting point between the large pumpkin and the small one under underneath it. And in this stage, for the first time, we're starting to um, realize that cool effect of this is dark and this is light, right? And notice how I'm not working with grays for most of this painting. Despite me using secondary colors and doing a lot of mixing, you can still tell what color, what every color is. And that's very important. Again, everything in balance, despite it being nuanced, it's still quite strong because the colors are relative to one another. It's very easy to discern an orange from a green, even if they're not too strong of colors. So everything is in balance again, not too muted, but also not overly saturated. Now it's time to get some strong values in there and even lift back some highlights if necessary. So you keep charging and lifting while the paint is still wet. That's when you can do all of these things. Now onto the next stage, uh, we're going to switch gears and address the pumpkin on the very right. It's composed mostly of oranges and violets. Now my main concern is this one's at the edge. So how can I have this pumpkin support and enhance the rest of the painting without getting too much in the way or being redundant or repetitive. And so the function I chose for it is to not get in the way, not take too much attention while still maintaining it's another pumpkin, uh, which is why I'm using mostly cool grays with a hint of violet. This is very different from the white cream pumpkin, because even though it's still a muted kind of loose gray color, I'm going for much darker values and immediately looking at this one, 
uh, you can tell that it's dark, right? Now, looking back at this specific part of the process, I could have actually created a nice blue and red play here, just for variety's sake. I could have used a bit red in there, like Alvar Castanet tends to do. Um, but you know what? You'll never know the alternative, so don't judge yourself too harshly for things you could have done. Maybe it would have taken too much attention away from the rest of the painting, right? Uh, but you can always have another go at the scene if you're, you don't like something. No one said you only have one attempt, right? You can always do another one and another one. Now, I'm leaving some white spaces because I want to convey where the stem's edge is and also to convey some very loose highlights and off we go to the main pumpkin now. So we still have one elephant to address in the room and it's the pumpkin's right side, right? This is incredibly important because this is one of the more interesting contrast points of the scene when it comes to edges. So look at how the cast shadow creates a lovely sharp edge and I'm gonna mark this for you while the right side of the pumpkin ends on a soft edge, right? To me, that's a very important contrast to show. It helps us understand one is a cast shadow and one is a shadow caused by the rounded shape of the pumpkin. So, after pre-wetting the entire right side thoroughly, it's time to establish the shadows. Now, for this technique of pre-wetting over an existing wash, if you're using a high enough of a quality of paper, and you're gentle, gentle enough with the uh, brush, and the wash underneath is 100% dry, which is key, you should be able to pre-wet successfully over an already dried wash, okay? Now, the paper is really important for that. Cheaper paper will usually reawaken the paint that's there. Now, I'm starting to charge in gentle violets and oranges, and the tricky part is knowing how dark to go, right? Because we're doing this wet and wet, and it's a, it's a very dark but still warm orange. Uh, so, you want it to feel like one pumpkin, and especially to feel like it's connected to the left side. So, you have to always watch these two together to make sure you get the right context between the two. Now, around the deeper creases, I'm going for more of a violet because that's just darker. And around the outer, rounder parts of the pumpkin, I'm using more of that dark orange. And I'm making sure to preserve the soft edge. That's really important because that was the whole point of this area, to contrast it with the hard edge on the left, right? So this area has to end with a soft edge. Now, I darken some of the lower sections too. This is very important to do while everything is still wet, just like I've shown you in the previous wash. Um, and understand, you'll need to mix a very thick mix of paint to get it to be this dark. Like this is another extremely common mistake I see people make. The paint needs to barely move on the palette and you need to mix plenty of it, okay? So m this act of mixing close to dry paint is a challenge at first, but you will get it with some practice, okay? Um, I'm using this dark paint all across the painting where darker details need to be added because once I mix it and it is a challenge, I want to make the most out of it and I am still missing some details here and there, right? Now, take your time here, observe the reference photo and ask yourself what needs to be added in order to improve the painting, right? Where do, am I missing some details? And if the painting can do without a detail, very often I'll leave it out completely, okay? Now, sometimes if you're confused and you're unsure and you have a tendency to overwork your paintings, simply taking a break and then maybe returning a few hours later with fresh eyes can really help. Uh, you may go back to the painting and tell yourself, well, it's perfect, I don't need to change anything. Or you may think to yourself, wow, I completely missed this detail, so let's add that, let's change some stuff around. That can very often happen. Now, before we remove the tape and call it a day, because we're almost done, remember that bonus tip I told you about? So here it is. Whenever you're uncertain of anything, add water. It sounds stupidly simple, right? But this is actually something that saved me on many occasions. So sometimes you'll see me struggle a bit through the details, not knowing exactly what's going on in the scene. Maybe I'm having a hard time recognizing the shapes or recognizing the pattern of values, something like that. When that happens, I'll find myself, you know, scribbling too much or anything like that. I'll simply add some water to the paper. And I'll either do it with a brush or a variation of it is using your water sprayer. What this does is it merges all the crap I put on the paper basically, making it look much cleaner. And then because it's watercolor, you have the benefit of also being able to add more details to it, wet and wet, or to lift, because you added water, right? And again, this sounds 
stupidly simple, but it saved me on so many occasions. And you can use the brush again or the water spray, right? Now, whenever it feels like you've created a mess and you don't even know what's going on, spray some water. It'll clear things up for you and allow you more time for decision making, right? And just know that sometimes you'll need to protect other areas uh, that you're happy with so they don't re-wet again. So, so you can uh, block it with your hand or put a piece of paper and spray. Just be a little careful with that technique, right? And in any case, now we can uh, finally remove the tape, sign this, remove the tape uh, and reveal this beautiful painting. I really hope you found this lesson helpful. Please let me know in a comment below your thoughts. And I'd greatly appreciate if you like this video and subscribe if you still aren't. I have tons of these planned out for you. And I'd also like to give a huge thanks to all of my patrons and supporters on Patreon. You're the people who allow me to make a living basically for my passion. And I am greatly thankful for that. And also you're, you allow me to do all of these tons of lessons for free over on YouTube for everyone else to enjoy. So thank you so, so much. And if you want to support me on Patreon, the link is going to be down below and you'll get a credit at the end of the video. And lastly, if you consider purchasing an original painting of mine, this specific pumpkins painting and many others will be available on the gallery. So give it a look. I want to thank you so, so much. And I will see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.